This is Love Notes, daily devotions from Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. Grace and peace to you. Our text today is John, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 15. It begins by telling us, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, it clarifies, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. It is not good news for the Pharisees that Jesus is baptizing even more disciples than John was. As we have seen, they weren't too happy that John was baptizing. And now that Jesus is being even more successful, well, they're not happy about that either. You see, John and Jesus represent a, a disruption to the more, more normal spiritual life of the people of Judea. There are those officials who run the temple, and there are the Pharisees who run the synagogues, and they really do know what they're doing, at least according to them. And to have prophets and preachers coming from all kinds of different places and putting ideas in people's heads, well, that's suspicious. And so they're protective. They're worried. Jesus has not found that this is a, an appropriate time for a conflict to be escalated, and so he leaves Judea and he goes back to Galilee. It says in verse 4 that he had to go through Samaria to get there. Now, if you have a Bible atlas or a map in your Bible that shows this area at the time of Jesus, you will see that the most direct route from Jerusalem to Galilee is, in fact, through a part of Samaria, although there are other routes. And the truth of the matter is that the, the hatred and the animosity between Samaritans and Jews is so intense that most Jews would do anything they could to stay out of Samaria, and so they would ch take a, an alternate route. So when it says Jesus had to go through Samaria, that's not a geographic fact. It's a fact of his mission. Jesus has to go through Samaria because there are Samaritans there, and he's been sent to save the whole world, not just the Jews. So he comes to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Here is an acknowledgment that there in Samaria, the history of Israel, all of the people of Israel, including Judea, is present. Jesus comes to that well, and he's tired out by his journey. He's been walking all day, all morning at least. And so he sits down by the well, and the text tells us it was noon. The heat of the day is upon them. Verse 7 tells us now that a Samaritan woman came to draw water. We should stop there for a moment. It is the custom of the day that women would draw water to sustain their households for cleaning and cooking and drinking by gathering at the cooler part of the day in the early morning, not long after the sun came up, they would all gather together and they would draw out the water and take it home. This, of course, was an occasion for a community event. They all got together and they shared the latest news and gossip. They caught up on what was going on in each other's families. It was a, a support. Uh, but it also was probably what community can be, a place to spread malicious gossip. That the woman comes to the well at noon suggests that she is trying to avoid this community. She doesn't want to have anything to do with it. That's a curious little speed bump in the story, and it'll be explained as the story unfolds. Jesus sees her, and since he's been walking all morning and doesn't have a bucket with him, he needs to depend upon somebody who has a jar or a bucket to get water out of the well. We're told in verse 8 that the disciples aren't around to do this because they've gone into town to get food for them all to eat. So he asks the woman for a drink. Give me a drink. Now the Samaritan woman 
looks at him and says, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? And it explains, Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Samaritans are unclean. And so you don't share table fellowship. You don't share water. You don't even share space on the road if you can help it. So how is it that you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink of water? How does she know that Jesus is a Jew? Uh, Part of it might be from dress. Both cultures had customs about how one dressed. Uh, A faithful Jew like Jesus would have his prayer philosophies, his robe uh, showing, and so they might see that. They might notice the accent of a person from Galilee and assume that he is Jewish. They may know that he came down the road and by his position has come from Jerusalem. Whatever it is, she knows he's a Jew and she wonders, why do you want to have anything to do with me? So Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman says to him, Sir, you have no bucket. The well is deep. Where do you get this living water? She's pretty sure that she knows the only source in town is that well, and Jesus obviously is dependent upon whoever can get it for him. There's a parallel here with the story of Nicodemus that we heard in the third chapter. Jesus begins to talk in spiritual language. He begins to use metaphor to point to a reality of the kingdom of God. And like Nicodemus, this woman hears it literally. Jesus isn't speaking of real water. When he says living water, she thinks he means a running brook, a spring. But that's not what Jesus is talking about at all. She then asks, are you greater than our ancestor Jacob? And we have another example of John's wonderful use of irony. You as the reader, us as readers, know that Jesus is in fact greater than Jacob. Her question is ironic. She thinks the answer is no, but we know the answer is yes. It was Jacob who gave us this well with his sons and his flocks drank from it. Jesus now goes deeper, as he did with Nicodemus, explaining the spiritual reality. Everyone who drinks of this water, the water of this well, even though it comes from Jacob, will be thirsty again. That's truth. But those who drink of the water that I will give them, this living water, they will never be thirsty Jesus explains further, the water I will give will become in in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. It's a spiritual, inside them sort of thing. It is like being born again, and Nicodemus doesn't get that at first. This spiritual water or the spiritual birth that he talks to Nicodemus about are, are fruits of the Spirit and the work of the Word made flesh dwelling among us. The woman's starting to see the light, although not fully, and she says to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Never be thirsty. She's starting to see the spiritual life that Jesus is offering, but she also knows it sets her free from ever having to come to this well and be embarrassed by the women of the community again. In fact, she shows that she catches on a little faster than Nicodemus did. Jesus here is once again revealing who he is. He is the true source of water. Jesus and the power of the spirit that Jesus bestows upon us helps us to have a spiritual life where we never thirst for anything because God is always present. Jesus offers us eternal life just as he offered Nicodemus something that is bigger and greater than our daily needs. And the woman has begun to see that this is not just your average Jew looking for a free drink of water. Jesus is offering her us much more. 
so what does the eternal water of life look like for you? Is it a cleansing thing that washes away all that keeps you from being who God calls you to be? Is it something that gives life, keeps you hydrated, spiritually speaking? Is it something about the relationship with God that continues to flow in you, even when the world seems to be crashing out of control? This woman comes to the well, a woman full of shame, it appears, and she encounters in Jesus a word that offers her life. May we pray that the same thing is offered to us. Amen.